Okay, hi everybody. For our final topic in this little section on the Euclidean group, I wanted to prove the following proposition. The only finite subgroups of the Euclidean group of the plane are either Zn, the cyclic group with n elements, or Dn, the dihedral group with n elements. And uh, this has some implications for the kinds of symmetric objects that you can draw on the plane, and I'll say something about that at the end. So how do we prove this? Well, um, the first thing we observe is that, um, let's suppose that H is a finite subgroup of the Euclidean group. Well, E of two has four kinds of elements. Translations, glide translations, reflections, and rotations. These two things have infinite order because if you have a translation, you keep doing that, you never come back to the origin. And if you have a glide reflection, you go a distance and reflect, and then you go another distance and reflect. So if you do that twice, it's a translation. So, and translations have infinite order. So if you have a finite subgroup of the Euclidean group, it can't contain any translations or glide rotate, translations, glide reflections. This should be glide reflections. It has to contain either only reflections and rotations. And that means that um, H fixes the origin. because reflections and rotations fix the origin. And that means that H actually has to be a subgroup of the uh, orthogonal group, which in turn is a subgroup of E of two. That is to say, if you think of elements H and H of the, uh, in the form AA, then the little a has to be zero. Otherwise, it can't uh, be an element of finite order. So um, that reduces our problem to finding finite subgroups. H is a finite subgroup of O of 2. And what we, do we know about O of 2? Well, O of 2 has a subgroup, SO2, consisting of all the rotations. And these are just the matrices, we've seen them many times, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. Theta is just between zero and two pi. And let's, uh, to simplify the notation, call this matrix R theta. It's the rotation by theta matrix. And SO2, is just the collection of matrices R theta. O2, SO2 is of index two in O2. And so um, to give a coset, there's only one non-trivial coset for SO2 in O2. And if we choose a T of determinant one, like for instance, this matrix, then O2 splits up into two cosets. It's SO2 together with TSO2. Now, um, T squared is a T is a reflection. It's the reflection which sends uh, the X, it, it reverses I and leaves J alone. So here's, I'll draw the picture. This is T, it takes I over, right? It sends X to minus X, but leaves Y alone. An element of the coset TSO2 is of the form T R theta. But um, let's just do a quick calculation. What is T R theta T inverse? Well, that's minus one zero one times cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta times minus one zero zero one. And if you work this out, you find that this is cosine theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta, which is R minus theta. In other words, if you um, conjugate a rotation by, a re by this particular reflection, it reverses the rotation. 
But even more, what does that tell you about an arbitrary element of the coset, tr theta? Suppose you square it. Well, this is t r theta, t r theta, which is t r minus theta, sorry, t squared r minus theta r theta, which is the identity. Because t squared is the identity, and r minus theta times r theta is the identity. So in fact, in the two cosets, O of 2 is breaks up into two, two types of elements. There's the um, rotations and the reflections. And those are the two cosets of, o, of SO2 in O2. Now let's take our finite subgroup, H in O2. And let's consider two cases. First of all, H actually is in SO2, so it has no reflections. So then H is a collection of rotations, but it's a finite order. How can that happen? Well, the only way that can happen is there must be a smallest angle. There must, among the thetas, there must be And that rotation has to be a fraction of 2 pi because r theta to the n, which is r to n times 2 pi over n is r 2 pi, which is r, uh, which is r 0. If, if your angle wasn't a fraction, of, uh, a fraction of 2 pi, there'd be no n that you wouldn't you would never come back to the origin, but it's supposed to be a finite order. So the only way you can have an element of finite order is if it's cyclic, if the group subgroup is cyclic and it's generated by some smallest initial rotation. So um, if H contains no reflections, then it's cyclic generated by a smallest angle, smallest reflection angle, and that's the first case. H is isomorphic to Zn. The second case is that H contains a reflection. Let's call that reflection V. And we know that any reflection is of the form T R sub phi, where phi is some angle. And we also know that if you intersect H with SO2, that this is generated by the same argument we gave up above tells us that this is generated by some reflection, some minimum rotation, R theta, R2 theta, out to r n minus 1 theta. And <clears throat> so uh, h is, consists of what elements? Well, it consists of the elements 1 up to r n minus 1 theta. And it consists of this reflection v, v r, v r squared, v r to the n minus 1. And that's everything, because if you take an element in H which is not in SO2, it has determinant minus 1, multiply that times v, you get an element of determinant 1, so it's one of these guys. So there can only be just, there can only be one coset uh, outside of SO2, of even for H, and since this V is a reflection, we know that V squared is equal to the identity. And since um, we know that for any rotation, V R V inverse is R inverse. In other words, and finally, we know that R to the N is the identity. And if you put these pieces together, you see that H in this case has to be the dihedral group. So, um, the two possibilities to recap are that if H doesn't contain a reflection, then it's cyclic of order n. And if it does contain a reflection, then it's dihedral of order 2n corresponding to the polygon of order n. And um, how, what does this give you in terms of symmetry? Well, uh, if, let's draw a little picture here. So let, if, let's say, for example, that n were, um, 
or six. So that would mean that we would have um, a hexagon here. Let's draw a hexagon if I can. And uh, we would divide the, we'd have these six ray, uh, these rays radiating from the origin. And the symmetries are the rotation, which carry uh, this triangle to this triangle, this triangle to that triangle, and so forth, or the reflections, which reflect um, this triangle to this triangle, this triangle to this triangle, this triangle to that triangle, and so forth. And then, of course, there's also, so there's the three reflections around these uh, di diameters and also the three reflections through the midpoints of the side. So there's six reflections and six rotations. Um, if we just drew the hexagon, we would have the fall group dn. How do we draw something where we reduce the symmetry group so that it's, that, that it's only reflections? Uh, sorry, it's only rotations, not reflections. Well, suppose we... Um, put something in here like uh, which is not um, symmetric by reflection. So for instance, suppose we put an arrow like this here and an arrow like this here and an arrow like this here and an arrow like that there and an arrow like that there and an arrow like that there. So we've decorated our polygon. Now, the reflections are, um, these reflections through here are no longer symmetries. And neither are these, because if you reflect through here, then this arrow comes across over here and it ends up pointing in the wrong direction. So the only symmetries that are left of this diagram are the rotations. If you leave the arrows out or you make something that is symmetric under reflection, then you get the full symmetry group. So um, in this way, we see that the, the dihedral group is a very kind of natural object, uh, and the regular polygons are the only objects that somehow arise naturally in these, um, that have this high degree of symmetry.